Now on to the last part of our program today. And this is something a little bit different, a virtual fireside chat. Now, uh, as many of you might be wondering, um, particularly from the conversation that we just had now, is what can the future of policymaking possibly hold for us? This is a very poignant question, I think, in the crossroads of uh, the, this point in time where we stand where there's a lot of uncertainty towards the future. And for this conversation, guiding us through this fireside chat, we'll be back on stage, Yara Azma, the regional strategy manager of FNF MENA, of course. And she will be having this conversation with a special guest um, that we've mentioned earlier, Steve Clemens, the former editor-at-large for The Atlantic, and current editor for The Hill. Yara, before you start, uh, I was hoping I could uh, squeeze in one tiny question. Uh, or maybe let's make it two questions. The first question is, um, well, I'm very interested to hear why you specifically invited Steve uh, with his insight from the US to join this particular conversation. And then perhaps maybe more tongue in cheek, Will there actually be a virtual fire at this fireside chat or not? Well, maybe I should ask you Glenn, to conjure up like a virtual fire with your <laughs> virtual superpower from Istanbul. <laughs> well, um, you know, uh, we don't want to burn down the studio. These virtual fires uh, these days can be very realistic. <laughs> <laughs> but let me go back to the, your actual question, why Steve and why the conversation with Steve is because he will bring a unique per, uh, perspective through his career experience that you, he would have uh, a big oversight on our part if we did not include that perspective in that conversation on the future of policy making. Uh, Steve, uh, welcome. Great to be with you. I should mention I'm sitting right next to a fireplace that you can see there. I would, if I'd known, I would have like built a fire and we would have had that, that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, we're so happy to have you with us. It's an honor to have you. Steve Clemens, editor at large at The Hill. Pre previously, you served as a Washington editor at large of The Atlantic. You, ha you have one of the most popular political blogs, The Washington Note. You also founded and served a senior, uh, uh, ser uh, still serves, uh, serving as a senior a fellow at the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation, where you previously served as executive vice president. Again, it's an honor to have you with us, um, uh, Steve, Great to be with you. Uh, at the Amman Innovation and Politics Forum digital version. Before I start, um, I have, I have a, like a, uh, a special hello to you from our regional director in North America office, Klaus Gramko. And I quote cool. him, he told me, say hi to Steve and ask him, where have you been? <laughs> Steve, where have you been? I, I have been uh, working away in Washington. I mean, the, uh, uh, the challenges right now of reporting and managing a reporting team on American politics are crazy. So I love Klaus. Klaus has been a friend of mine for decades, and it's uh, great to hear from him. And I will ask you now, where have you been, Steve, from the presidential elections? What, are you, what is your take on the results and what do you expect from the upcoming administration? Look, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have won the election and they've won it um, even as results of last night that uh, Georgia, which is, you know, we have a, a system where Americans don't vote directly for the president of the United States. They vote for what are called electors in a state by state process. Uh, and that's why you often hear about battleground states um, where states like Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Arizona and Nevada and Georgia get a lot more attention than California uh, or Washington State or other places because those votes are predictable. Um, it's, in the, it's in the states of the United States that are not pre predictable. And we've just seen Georgia and Michigan essentially commit uh, to follow uh, the, the popular vote of their people that went for Joe Biden, even by a narrow uh, margin. And so there's no pathway for President Trump. There's been a dispute because President Trump has refused to thus far concede the election. And I interviewed President Trump's national security advisor last Monday, and even Robert O'Brien, the national security advisor, 
uh, said that that Joe Biden's national security team was professional. He said nice things about them. He said, look, uh, we see that that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris looks like they've won. So we're going to have a professional transition. Almost everyone gets that except uh, the president and a couple of his lawyers. So I think you're going to see the transition uh, begin to shape, take shape, um, hopefully soon, but it will happen. And America has been in this before. A lot of people, you know, get caught up and concerned. Is this undermining democracy? I mean, it's creating a lack of trust. And we have to remember that 73 million people voted for President Trump. And that's going to be a thorn in the side to the Biden administration. But now the Democrats and Joe Biden are going to get a chance to try and heal some of the problems and try to speak to the nation as a whole, as opposed to, I think, President Trump's strategy was dividing people. So I think we're going to see a Biden administration come in. It's going to have lots of challenges, um, but, but that's where we are. How do you think this transition will be translated on the policy level? Look, I, I think there are going to be a variety of things. You can just think across the board from, you know, connecting people to the Internet. We've all, during the COVID crisis, been forced into, you know, digital moments like we're having right now. But a lot of Americans are not connected. You're going to see things like broadband, the digital divide, uh, what we do to smartly respond to the COVID crisis, which we have not been smart. We've been the dumbest advanced country in the world. We have to face that. We have incredible rates of ongoing infection, over 150,000 new cases a day. And while there are many places in Europe and even where you are where there's a bit of an upsurge, it's nothing like what's happening in the United States. So it's um, a remarkable failure. And I think you're going to see the Biden team try to work very quickly on that dimension. But things on climate change, on uh, looking at the environment, on education, on economic conditions of people right now who, through no fault of their own, who are unemployed and uh, having a tough time struggling in this crisis. So you're going to have the economic, the environmental, you know, the technology uh, dimensions of this, and you're going to see a big shift. The problem Joe Biden is going to have is all of this stuff costs money and uh, the bank is empty right now. Um, going back to what you mentioned on this like transition on, on uh, so many levels, economy and, and energy and climate change, in one of uh, your interviews with uh, Monica Trousey in the Off Menu <laughs> show, you were asked if you were to uh, moderate the presidential election, what would be your question for the candidates? And you said that you will ask them how uh, to get to the emission reductions below the two degree level and how does the mathematical equation would look like? Although I didn't understand what you mean by mathematical mm -hmm. equation, and I don't think any of the debates that took place answered your question. But what, what are your expectations on this level from the right. Congress, from the administration, or any government in the world when it comes to uh, energy and climate change policies? Yara, thank you for asking that. Look, I'm one of these guys who sees the world and its challenges in many shades of gray. Many issues are often presented as if there's a good answer and a bad answer, a, you know, a, a, a black hat and a white hat, you know, a binary choice. And I think when it comes to environment and climate change, I have many, many friends that are progressives uh, in the environmental movement. And along with wanting to get more and more uh, green energy sources, which I support, uh, and they wrap it around climate change, the truth is they cannot get to the climate targets that we need to get, both that are uh, dictated and outlined in the Paris Climate Accord, and that I think the world needs from what we just understand from science, unless we have other forms of energy that are non-carbon emitting. And so what we were discussing with Monica Trousey uh, was the nuclear energy issue, that, that there have been a lot of advances in nuclear energy. There's a uh, awesome. But this is one of the issues which many people don't want to talk about. But I've talked about it to, to a very famous secretary of energy in America, Ernie Moniz. He's a hero of the environmental movement, but he says we can't do it without nuclear energy. So, yes, while we do solar, wind, biofuels, many other areas that can be developed, unless you build the nuclear energy piece into it in the U.S. and in many other um, advanced developing countries, we won't hit those targets. So when I talk about the mathematical equation, what I'm trying to tell people who are well-meaning 
I know this is controversial, but I said, do the math, do the math and look at what uh, solar and these other uh, energies do. And let's applaud that. But it's not enough to actually uh, remediate and check and stop um, the heating of the planet, heating of the uh, atmosphere. So that's what I was trying to get at. Uh, talking about like nuclear energy and um, uh, you were and I would like to to bring you to us to to the MENA region you were one of the uh, people who spoke openly that uh, uh, is supporting the JCPOA or what is uh, known by the Iran deal. Uh, do you think this step towards Iran was a step towards an innovative approach to nuclear policies on the international level or it just was an attempt to create a historical deal with Iran while neglecting the uh, nuclear policies on the international level? Look, um, the, 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 Iran is a complicated country. It's a divided country. And America is divided itself in many different factions about Iran. What I thought was important about the JCPOA, it was not built, it was not an agreement built on trust. It was entirely transactional. And at the time it was being negotiated, and this is what I find very disingenuous of the critics of the JCPOA, there are many other areas where Iran, uh, uh, whether it's ballistic missile development or whether it is transnational uh, Hezbollah-style terror support or something of these various kinds of activities that Iran, because of its paranoia as a state and because of the way it's organized internally, which is a lot of it is organized against uh, uh, pointing at nations like the United States, but also Germany and others, as as being antithetical to everything that it's about. It's a theocracy um, that I think is horrible to its people. That said, a nation like that with very strong nuclear weapons capacity changes the game for the world. Having a nuclear weapon, as we've seen with North Korea, for instance, changes its stature in the world and you have to deal with it in a different way um, than you would otherwise. So keeping Iran <clears throat> from eventually acquiring a weapon was the highest national security priority of the United States at that time. And frankly, it should have remained that. What Donald Trump has done by suspending the JCPOA, by undoing the deal, remember the deal was to get economic investment inside Iran, that Iran to end the sanctions. They didn't just do it to give up the, I mean, Iran basically did everything that we asked it to do. And then we reneged, you know, the one that was not compliant was the United States, Germany, England, Britain, France, China, Russia, all uh, were parties to that deal, all were compliant and all saw Iran remain compliant. The United States reneged on that deal. The United States undermined it because the argument was that the way that the um, JCPOA was written, that 15 or more years down the road, it left a nuclear option potentially for Iran to come back. You know, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't see why Iran would snap back into that position if its economy, if it's, you know, I think the big risk and, you you know, the Nauman Stiftung, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a system that focuses on liberalism. Iran is not a liberal place. The question is, as you begin to see economic development, connectivity, Iran having a track potentially to come out of the cold, to begin interacting, does that create the embers of liberalism there? I don't know the answer to that, but it creates a possibility that right now doesn't exist the way we're proceeding. So I think that um, given the pace and rate of Iran's nuclear program previously, it was clear that in part because of Israel and its, its, its uh, uh, priority to America and uh, its security to America, but we were on a collision course for a real war with Iran that could create a lot of other unintended consequences. And that would be incredibly reckless. I'm not an, I'm not an automatic pacifist, but I do not believe in wars of choice or wars that are reckless if there are other options. And that's why I think the JCPOA for a decade and a half and probably more would have given us a track where Iran would have had a certain route. And that the criticism of it, well, what about its behavior, you know, in other areas, its behavior in Yemen, in Lebanon, wherever it may be in Syria. 
And and the issue is we didn't the Republicans refused to support a grand bargain deal back then. I think it's disingenuous to say now, oh, now they'll only do a grand bargain. That's ridiculous. And so I have a lot of I have no patience for those that want to play a whack-a-mole game with Iran. We've, we've now have to figure out where to go. It's going to be very hard. I know a lot of the Iranian leadership, they do not trust the United States and they don't trust one president anymore. The president's word used to matter and mean something, but if it changes from president to president so quickly and you have discontinuity every four years and not continuity, that is a very, very hard problem uh, to solve. But the Iranian-U.S. relationship is a very complicated topic that we, we need like hours to discuss. But um, um, allow me to say something. Like the moment uh, here in the MENA region, uh, we heard that Joe Biden uh, uh, is the next uh, pres president of the United States. There were some like uh, positive or like some uh, optimism in like the Biden administration to rethink nuclear policies, to retackle nucle nuclear policies, either uh, through uh, renegotiating the JCPOA or other means. Do you think this will happen? The Biden administration is interested in rethinking nuclear politics in this sense? Well, I think they're going to rethink it in a global sense. I mean, there's been a deterioration and erosion of some of the basic nuclear agreements with Russia, uh, for instance. Um, and there hasn't been a strategy in place, whether you look at North Korea and trying to sort of negotiate a denuclearization of North Korea, which has totally failed, or you look at what the president has been concerned with, with regarding to including China. There are a lot of dynamics out there. But what we do know is that Russia on a lot of fronts and and perhaps now the united states you know the president said president trump said something about a classified program that very few of us know know anything about about a revived kind of potentially smaller theater nuclear weapon uh it was very surprising he said this but if that is true then it creates again a new field where you're going to have nations um, scrambling to fill in what they see are their security deficits and security voids. And hopefully the Biden administration <clears throat> with dip diplomacy will encourage, because that is such a dangerous route for the world, we'll discuss a way to uh, bring those new emerging nuclear uh, weapons into some sort of negotiated uh, regime, a treaty regime. But right now, as things stand, it's, it, you know, the Joe Biden administration is going to be, you know, have a lot on its plate. It's going to have, it has COVID crisis raging in America. It has economic problems. We have racial and policing problems. We have nations that don't trust us as much as they once did. It's going to be a complicated lift on a lot of these things, but the nuclear portfolio will be part of it. I just can't tell you what priority level that will have. My sense is it will not be at the highest uh, at the top of the list, sadly, because I think it's very, very important. Uh, you mentioned the COVID crisis in the U.S. and that is like um, uh, deteriorating uh, with the days. Uh, COVID-19 didn't come as a surprise uh, for especially a researcher. Like the Ebola virus was the first alarm for this, that an internet, a global pandemic might take place. And for that, under Obama administration, research was intensified, whereas uh, the rhetoric of pandemic was used for the show under uh, Donald Trump. I have two questions for you on this level. The first question, what do you think should have been done on an internal level to, um, uh, to, to handle properly the pandemic in the, in the U.S.? Uh, did the U.S. need more innovative and advanced approaches uh, to overcome the disease? And my second question is more on the international level. Um, uh, do you think that the COVID-19 created opportunities on the diplomatic level and created new approaches uh, to, to um, uh, uh, relations between countries, just like in the MENA region, the Israeli and the Gulf states uh, rapprochement. So on, on the first question, I may need you to get to reframe the second question, but the first question, I don't think it's rocket science. I think America failed on the front end well, that the moment President Trump in the very earliest part of January of this year knew 
the severity. We know he know, knew it because he told in a taped interview with Bob, the writer Bob Woodward, he knew how dangerous this virus was and he lied to the American public about that. But from that moment, what should have been done is they should have followed what they did in the simulation. Forget the playbook the Obama administration did. They did a simulation in October of 2019, just a few months before this, of the Trump administration key agencies on what to do in the decision making with regard to pandemic. They did a simulation. Had they just looked at what they learned from that and implemented the lessons of that, America would be in a very different place today. They failed to uh, take seriously uh, defense production orders. That's a, a law in the United States that gives the US government the ability to tell various industries that have a lot of dormant manufacturing capacity to immediately turn that manufacturing capacity, almost as if you're at war, into the creation of protective gear for frontline workers. Secondly, they should have immediately put together a test that, that was nationally deployed and that rather than treating the test as a rare thing, we needed to flood the American system businesses, communities, with testing and tracing. Every single person of stature, Republican and Democrat, it, that's, that's thoughtful and serious, said we needed to do that. And it's an incredible failing. And what they did, and it's just remarkable, that when the, um, the test came out, they had added a third vector, which was unnecessary. And it was testing positive. It was people that had nothing to do with COVID. And so they froze that test out there. When they came back and they realized what it had done, I mean, this shows you what Keystone Cops operation it was, uh, which means chaotic operation. They actually ended up going back and using that same test and just ignoring that data, which is the right decision from the very beginning. So the, the, the incompetence, the, the one step forward, two step back approach, and then the president's, this is unforgivable, the president's embrace of those people who saw mask wearing as a conspiracy, as a um, forfeiture of liberty. That dimension became crazy and it animated a political divide over basic health and basic science. So that can't be solved by innovation. That is just simple idiocy and stupidity in government. And hundreds of thousands of Americans are, are getting sick each day. And we've had over 260,000 people die, probably more uh, from this disease because of that incompetence. I feel very strongly about it. And it's something that I think history books will not forgive this administration for. On your second question, you may need to retell it to me again. Yeah, I based my second question on one of the interviews that you had with the ambassador of UAE in, uh, or the Emirates in, uh, to the US. And you were discussing with him the opportunities of COVID-19 when it comes to right. uh, operation between countries. I just wanted to check, do you believe that COVID-19 changed the chess sports for diplomats and created more opportunities for cooperation on the international level? In a way it did, because I think when you have something, I mean, I think the same thing is true in a way with climate. Any transnational problem, whether it's, you know, sometimes the world deals better with things and sometimes not. You know, there's a global refugee crisis right now. The MENA region is uh, a, a key a, a key platform for that. But I think COVID hit every country, every corner of the world, rich nations, poor nations, powerful people, uh, the least powerful people. And I think it created a sensitivity and concern that opened up the notion that maybe we need to do things differently. Now that doesn't make something like the Abraham Accords automatically happen or that they happen because of COVID, but it does raise the question that I'll tell you, the, you know, uh, Yusuf Otaiba, the ambassador I interviewed, does not uh, see the, uh, uh, the progress the way I do, but he sees the issues related to what Israel was planning to do in annexing the West Bank as being a red line that, if crossed, would prevent any nation from finally moving. So they did a transaction with Israel. They said, do not annex the West Bank and we will normalize with you. Now a lot of other nations are coming in. That has changed the chessboard. Maybe COVID helped create the need for the sense we need to do something that shows progress, but um, I don't think COVID necessarily did that. But I would also say, you know, to be self-critical of, of, of America's posture, that there is the, the other void, that there's a, a, a sense of void 
uh, left as America has been distracted and America first policies self-absorbed and narcissistic that that other nations are trying to fill in that void right now by moves like what the UAE initiated. Uh, in our talk, um, Steve, we talked about Joe Biden, we talked about Donald Trump, we talked about Obama and their administrations. You've encountered, or you met a lot of world affairs figures, and some of them you know them closely. Do you think that still with this, all of this technological uh, development and the impact of technology on policies, still personality of the leader, of, of the policymaker, is impacting uh, the direction of policymaking? You know, I think they're two different tracks. I think technology is um, is changing so rapidly that when you, you know, I, I, let me just put it this way. I tell people I feel like whether it's in health, whether it's in communications, whether it's in how we process and, you know, deal with problems, whether it's going to Mars, technology is at a level where it's so transformative on every front. And I'm very, very excited by that. I tend to... to to be someone that sees many more positives in that process. But if you were able to resurrect Galileo today, I think Galileo would still be found guilty. Uh, uh, you know, and, and what I'm trying to say is there is a equal number of people that reject science, that, that do not embrace this future, that look at these um, uh, issues of progress as ones they don't fully understand. And so both things can be true. So science advancing, but we have to understand that not everyone gets that message or sees the progress. They may want to have their smartphone, but they don't care about how you got, got there or the you know, scientific base to do that. Now, you ask on top of that, will leaders matter? Will their personality matter? Um, you know, Joe Biden, I wrote an article about um, then Vice President Biden called the Biden Doctrine. And it's about cultivating personalities and the gardening of personalities in global affairs that he knows and thinks about how he works. So yes, I mean, when you think about, you know, Russia will be different after Vladimir Putin, uh, Joe Biden and his personality and where they go will take America in a different direction than, than Donald Trump. Um, so person, I mean, when you think of Germany and what comes after Angela Merkel, uh, or Erdogan in Turkey or something of this. It's very hard at this moment. So technology is not something that would enhance or inhibit that, that you know, the, 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 the personality impact of these leaders. They're going to have to deal with each other. Technology extends, enables uh, um, those, those, those personality forces into policy and into taking shape. And they're also, you can combat them. Uh, those those personalities with technology. So I look at them as two slightly different currents. Um, uh, on, the, on this note, I have to mention something personal. I was fascinated by uh, the startups in DC that are only specialized in testing policies and in scientifically testing policies. And this is something mm -hmm. I think that, uh, we should look into more in the future. Uh, and uh, they will have an influence on public opinion, especially if they are scientifically proven to be uh, moving in the right or the wrong direction. Right. Uh, Steve, that was a really great talk. And uh, on the on a last note with you, uh, I want I want to ask you um, now. 2021 is waving to us like it's one month away. We thought that by the end of 2020, we'll see like a new world, a new perspective especially after what the world uh, went through uh, in this uh, very special year. As a, as a journalist, as a, um, uh, in, in a way or another, a uh, story digger, like you would look for stories, you would, you would like to know more about what's happening, uh, whether in the hill or in, uh, around the world. What do you think, what kind of stories do we need to contribute to change in our world? That's a big question, Yara, and I appreciate um, it. And I love the framing that 2021 is waving at us. Um, you know, I cover politics and policy. And I think that right now, whether you look at people on the far right, like we have a legislator named Matt Getz of Florida. He's a very hard right Trump supporter versus, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, uh, on right, we have a lot of people 
who live in and operate and, and politic in bubbles with people who are uh, devoted to them and to their views. And I guess I see uh, a year that's very messy, a year that's very divided. And what I'm really interested in on every policy issue is whether the reasonable middle of pragmatic, non-fanatical deal makers that are able to solve education problems, solve health problems. You know, we have racial divide problems, you know, growing economic inequality. We have, a, um, you, you know, one of the incredible, one of the things I love about, you know, Namenstiftung is the um, focus on uh, liberalism and a lot of the, 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 the business environment uh, is such that, you know, there's a lot of innovation in America, a lot of great startups that come. But we have to ask ourselves, is that ecosystem healthy uh, or have we undermined it in some way? You know, we have we have a immigration policies that don't make sense for the kind of nation America is and the rejection at so many levels. So I'm interested to see in, in issue after issue after issue whether or not we're going to be able to reject the fanatical positions of extremist demagogues on both sides and come back to the middle. And I think that's going to be the, the story of, of 2021, because if we don't see that come back together, then we're going to see America continue to whipsaw back and forth between very, very different visions of, of uh, itself. And it's going to become a less reliable stakeholder in global affairs. And I think that is the you know, that's the biggest question mark I have about the next year or two. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you with us at the Amman Innovation Politics Forum. And hopefully... My pleasure. ...soon, either in person or virtually again. My pleasure, Yara. Thank you, and gre greetings to all my friends in the Naumann Stiftung all over the world. Uh, I've done a lot with, uh, really through Klaus Gramkow. Uh, so, hi, Klaus. I hope you're watching. He's... Uh, He's a crazy, wild and crazy guy. So I'm around. Give me a call. Uh, and thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.